have already alluded to the three levels at which an anthropologist and historian operates. The level of what is felt ought to happen and what is widely thought does happen, the anthropologist observes behavior, listens to unsolicited comments and remarks uh, and remarks in the society and probes further with directed questions. The historian mainly depends on what might be called literary or polemical literature, as well as contemporary autobiographical material for these levels. The manuals, diaries, letters, plays and poems of the period tell us about these normative and observed levels, as does the legal code. But these should not be confused with the level of what does or did actually happen, the statistical level, often unperceived by actors in a society. This is reconstructed by the anthropologist by counting instances. For the historian, it is also a matter of counting cases, and often this is best done through an intensive study of a particular community or group of individuals. Nevertheless, in order to study any particular phenomenon, whether it be astrology or price rises, historians have to move from one level of evidence to another. To trust exclusively in any particular set of documents leads to a very great distortion, just as an anthropologist who merely counts and never asks questions, or vice versa, would prevent, represent a very impoverished and distorting account. For the moment, however, I would like to confine myself mainly to the statistical level. What can be found out about a contemporary community and about an historical one. By undertaking this comparison, I hope to show that the sources for the historical study are far richer than one might suppose. It convenient, conventionally takes one anthropologist one or two years to gather all the information concerning one community whereas it would take at least three times as long to collect the material for a similar sized historical community in Tudor and Stuart England, covering a period of 200 years. This does not reflect merely the superior ability of an anthropologist or the dispersion of the historical material. It is true that the anthropologist has one less stage in his research, for his community is already in action. He walks, or she walks, into an already constituted world, while the historian has to reconstitu reconstitute his or her subject matter before he can start to analyze it properly. Nevertheless, there is more to the difference of time than this. Here I would like to compare two communities which I am myself in the process of analyzing. A contemporary community in the Annapurna Range in central Nepal and the parish of Earls Cone in Essex over the period 1560 to 1680, sorry, 1560 to 1800. <clears throat> One way of uh, comparing the communities is by the total number of persons in the sample. The essence of the anthropological approach is personal contact, and this usually means that only five, about 500 to 1,000 persons can be studied in any depth. In the village of Tark in central Nepal, I studied some 520 persons, 
and by the end of fifteen months recognised all their faces. In the Essex village of Earl's Cone, the population averaged about 1,200 persons during the period of the study. Thus, it was over twice the size. In terms of man years, however, the contrast is much greater. I stayed in the Nepalese village for a little over a year. Thus, about 600 man years were actually studied. If one assumes that one has an average accurate historical recall of some ten years for every man, woman and child, one is only studying a little over 6,000 man years of recorded memory. The roughly 1,200 inhabitants of Earl's Cone at any point in time are being studied over a period of 300 years. Thus, one is investigating 360,000 man-years of behaviour, or over 60 times as much as even the most optimistic estimate for the Nepalese community. Another major difference lies in the field of sampling and comparison. Very similar records exist for several hundred other Essex parishes during this period, and it is possible to compare particular features in the chosen village with many other areas at the same point in time. In Nepal, I was only able to visit and study one other village, previously described by the French ethnographer Bernard Pignard, and this suggested that many of the features which I had taken as given or universal to the tribe on the basis of one village study were in fact extremely localised and possibly limited to the village of Tark. Yet until other anthropologists have worked elsewhere, this suspicion will be extremely difficult to prove or disprove. The bureaucracy of pre-industrial England was infinitely more record conscious than that of contemporary Nepal. Consequently, one has, in effect, the beginnings of statistical accounts for almost every parish in the county and in the country. It is therefore not too difficult to construct a sampling frame and to be more confident concerning the area to which one's generalizations apply. While conceding the immense superiority of numbers, an anthropologist could well retort that there are a whole range of topics which he can investigate, particularly in the realm of social attitudes and perceptions, which remain closed to the historian. This is, of course, true. But before we accept that quality entirely makes up for quantity, it is worth looking a little more closely at the various fields about which one can gather information in the two disciplines. If we use as a checklist the topics listed in the Royal Anthropological Institute Notes and Queries in Anthropology, the sixth edition, it would appear that approximately two-thirds of the areas could be tackled in an historical community study. Social structure, political organisation and economics could be very fully investigated. The fields of the social life of the individual, ritual and belief, knowledge and tradition and material culture could be partially investigated, while language would be almost totally beyond the reach of such a study. Overall it would seem that the width of problems which an anthropologist can study is indeed greater than those fields open to the investigator of English parishes in the past. 
though we can learn something concerning medicine, witchcraft, leisure, attitudes to time and so on, for many historical communities a systematic study of any of these could not be performed at the local level. On the other hand, in the fields of social structure, economics, and to a certain extent material culture, where there are probate inventories, which there are not for most of Essex, the historical information, though different from that used by the anthropologist, is often much richer. In order to see what information can, in practice, be gathered about individuals in an historical and an anthropological setting, let us compare two people. My knowledge of the two communities leads me to believe that both were middling to more poor men, both reached middle age, and there is no reason in either case to think in advance that they would be better documented than their co-inhabitants. One is Inrajit Gurung. In 1969, a retired staff ser sergeant from the British Army, aged 55. He represents the 40 or so adult males for whom I have the most information for Tark. Cornelius Brownson lived in Earlscone from 1610 when he was born to 1657 and described himself as a labourer in his will. The will is the most condensed portrait we have of the man. Brownson is only one out of well over 2,000 adult males who lived in the community during the period 1500 to 1800 and for whom we have similar information. How much material is there concerning these two people? A comparison between the amount of information can be seen by way of a diagram which I originally reproduced. illustrates under the various major fields the amount of information that is available. It can be seen from that diagram that the number of questions to which answers are obtainable is roughly equal, though one can find out a little more about the 17th century farm labourer than about the contemporary Gurung from my field notes. We may look at one variable in a little more detail in, a, in order to show how the comparison was made. I made a conventional attempt to record kinship links and cross-question Inrigid's elder brother about his ancestors. We may place the results against those from a preliminary set of links derived from historical sources for Cornelius Branson, and here I have another diagram. In terms of generation depth and complexity, the historical individual, though only a farm labourer, is better documented. This is partly a function of the lack of interest in ancestors or distant ancestors among the Gurungs. But even when, as in parts of Africa, one could have established a much more elaborate genealogy, it seems doubtful whether one would have been able to go back to each individual on the genealogy and create as full a picture of his life or her life history as of the original informant. Yet that is what one can do with the historical material. We know as much about Cornelius's father and his father's father as we do about Cornelius. 
and likewise about his father's brothers. Indrajit's father is totally obscure, apart from name, birth, date, death and place of origin. Another way of comparing the sources for historical anthropology with those for contemporary anthropology is to look in some detail at a field where anthropologists have rightly claimed a special competency, that of sexual behaviour and norms. We now know that parts of Western Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries enjoyed, if that is the word, a unique marriage pattern, which meant that there was a gap of some 10 years between puberty and marriage for the majority of the population, according to John Haynau. We also know that Europe inherited an ethic which stated that all premarital sexual behaviour was not only unwise, but immoral. This likewise places it in the minority of societies, according to Murdoch. Did the combination of social structure and ethic lead to a great deal of repression, frustration and sublimation as Malinowski or Freud might have argued. One possible index of a clash between individual desire and official morality might be expected to be the amount of premarital sexual intercourse. And one aspect of this would be the number and treatment of brides who were pregnant when they married. Changes in the uh, rates of bridal pregnancy could well be used as a wider index of basic change in the society under study. As a result, the topic is currently receiving considerable attention from such people as Peter Laslett and P. E. H. Hare. In the Nepalese society I studied, there are some hints that the age at which gurungs enter sexual relations has risen during the last 20 years. It seems likely that premarital sexual relations were once normal and not greatly disapproved of. Marriage was not the necessary gateway sexual intercourse. The institutional setting for premarital sex was the rodi, or communal house for unmarried persons of both, sex, both sexes, a parallel to the widespread phenomenon such as the Assamese longhouse or the Maria Gotal. More recently, the Gurungs have come under pressure from their Hinduized neighbours to the south and wait until marriage before commencing sexual relations on the whole. While virginity at marriage is still important, uh, it is possible that the scolding of a girl who has become pregnant before marriage is now harsher than it was. The pressure on her to marry the man responsible, if possible, may have grown. Again, we can see that knowledge of the number of brides pregnant at marriage and the treatment of them could provide information for the solution of several problems. The difference in the amount of information available to answer questions in this area, however, is immense. The data on the Nepalese village, apart from general statements about the reactions pe people might be expected to have or ought to have, uh, is very thin. It's impossible to tell which women were pregnant at marriage, 
since no question was asked directly in the census I took on whether a woman was pregnant or thought herself pregnant when she married. It's just possible that if I had asked for the month of marriage and the month of first birth, a few cases would have emerged. But with such a small sample, about 100 childbearing women, and the difficulties of recall over a period of about 10 years, there would only be a handful of cases. Thus, any kind of sociological analysis of bridal pregnancy is impossible, either at one point in time or over time. Not a single pregnant bride was encountered. Not a single remembered instance discussed. Nor is this a subject to which other anthropologists have made much of a contribution. The two central sources for an historical study of bridal pregnancy are parish registers and ecclesiastical court records. These provide the actual instances and sometimes some quantitative materials on attitudes. With parish registers, the technique is in principle simple. On the assumption that people were baptised a few weeks after birth, the gap between marriage and baptism of the first child is worked out and all those women whose first child is baptised within seven and a half months after marriage are presumed to have been pregnant when they married. If we look at our sample Essex village over the period 1585 to 1605, we can see the result of applying this technique in diagram 3. One could, in principle, do the same diagram for almost all the years between 1560 and 1840, some 280 years instead of 20. The total number of marriages registered in the parish is also shown in the diagram. It is possible to compare different decades different months, and so on. But first, it is best to add in the other major source, the ecclesiastical court records. Among the questions to be asked of vicars and church wardens in some of the parishes of Essex at this time was, whether there be in your parish any fornicators, adulterers, incestuous persons, boards, or any that receive such incontinent persons, or any that harbour women with child which be unmarried, or any persons that are vehemently suspected of any of these or such like faults, or that be out of good name and fame touching such crimes, who they be. This means that month by month, throughout the parishes of over half of Essex, as well as other parts of England, individuals were presented for a great number of sexual offences. A type of supervision of popular morality occurred, which is perhaps unique in English history, or at least uniquely recorded. If we confine ourselves to the same 20 years, though one could study approximately three times that length through these records, we find the following pattern. See diagram 4. We see here the total number of sexual offences each year, and within these, the number 
concerning the supposed offences of rival pregnancy. Over this period of 20 years, there were over 90 cases concerning sexual offences at the ecclesiastical courts, involving well over 140 pe people. About one-seventh of these concern brides pregnant at marriage, so that we are only dealing with a minor aspect of sexual behaviour. The combined information from these two sources does, however, give us a reasonable number of cases to juggle with, over 50 people in all. The overlap and numbers can be seen in a further diagram, diagram 5. The question then occurs, how much likelihood is there that we will be able to find out enough about other features of the individuals and the community to be able to suggest some plausible causal links? One further descent to the minutiae of actual life is necessary. We may look at some aspects of sexual behaviour in one Essex village over a three-year period, 1587 to 89. Work on the social background is still in the preliminary stage, but a few impressions may be worthwhile. During these three years, 12 people are known by name to have been suspected or guilty of sexual relations before marriage. Another 12 people, likewise of bridal pregnancy, 10 of adultery, 8 of bastardy, 4 for aiding and abetting sexual offenders, 2 in an attempted rape case, and one for malicious sexual rhymes. Of this total, about one third have so far been placed in the houses in which they were living. Their distribution can be shown in a map. See the map. The cases predominantly occur at the richer end of the village, rather than in the small cottages of Holt Street or the outlying farms. Given that this only represents approximately an equivalent to one year's cases, it can be seen that over several decades some interesting patterns will emerge and changes will be visible. In terms of occupation, the break, preliminary breakdown is as follows. Of the 12 men whose occupation has been established, three, a quarter, were engaged in agriculture as husbandmen or labourers. Half were artisans, three tailors, two bricklayers and one tinker. The other three were a miller, the schoolmaster and the vicar. Three out of four of the known women were servants. The other was a midwife. In terms of status, those involved range from church wardens, the vicar, the schoolmaster and major landholders to servants and labourers. The complete village spectrum seems to have been covered, though closer analysis and breakdown of each offence should reveal further patterns. As far as kinship is involved, it's possible to draw out partial genealogies for about half those involved. These often extend over several generations, and there are numerous overlaps between those involved in different cases. In terms of other deviancy, about half those named in connection with sexual offences 
were accused in other records of further offences, drunkenness, scolding, brawling, theft and so on. The sexual accusations were merely one thread in a complex web of social relationships, all of which have to be laid bare before the real meaning of the accusation can be understood. The picture of, of each character that emerges from this kind of microanalysis is often as vital as that which an anthropologist can find out in his fieldwork. It has the advantage of being equally good at any point in time. To illustrate this conclusion, let us look at just one of the individuals accused of a sexual offence in the three-year period. In 1589, Edward Reed, then aged 22, was cited to the ecclesiastical court as suspected to have begotten Joan Crabbe of the same with child on her accusation. Reed's genealogy and place of residence can be seen on diagram 6. The year before this bastardy allegation, Edward had been a witness to the rhyme supposedly made up about one of his neighbours as follows. Woe be unto Kendall that ever he was born. He keeps his wife so lustily, she makes him wear the horn. But what is he the better, or what is he the worse? She keeps him like a cuckold, with money in his purse. Then five years later, after the bastardy case, he was cited for brawling in the churchyard and calling one of the constables knave, for which offence he claimed to have been already punished by imprisonment. Most of the Reed family appear, in fact, to have been embroiled in sexual misconduct. Only four out of nine of Edward's siblings survived childhood, and the eldest married John Parker, sometimes constable, and son of one of the church wardens, whose house we can see in diagram six. She was two months pregnant when they married, and her husband was cited to the ecclesiastical court for this offence. Edward's younger sister, Rose, was accused of being begotten with child by Mr. Thomas Kelton, one of the gentry of Earlscombe. Edward's younger brother, John, was summoned in 1604 on vehement suspicion of incontinent living between him and Edith, the wife of Henry Bridge. The supposed adulteress's house can also be seen in the diagram. She was about 38 at the time, and her supposed lover, 32. If we look for precedents in the parental generation, they are not hard to find. Edward's father, Robert, was styled a yeoman, and his considerable land holdings are shown on a contemporary map. Although not known to be himself guilty of any sexual offences, there is some evidence that the most notorious prostitute in the village managed to blackmail him into paying her various sums of money. Edward's mother's brother was cited for receiving, receiving a harlot into his house, being with child, without the consent of the parish. And his mother's brother's wife was accused of adultery with the village schoolmaster. Their house is also shown in the diagram. 
It is clear from the occupations and statuses of those involved in this particular case that the family was among the middling husbandmen to yeomen group of villagers, the strata from whom church wardens, constables and jurymen in local courts were chosen. They were not only uh, not some unruly minority group of very poor. Investigation of other individuals has begun to suggest that one can fairly often probe right down to the lowest and most mobile elements in village society. More broadly, what an examination such as the above hopes to illustrate is that with some luck in the survival of sources, one is able to find out a very great deal about village relationships from the Elizabethan period onwards. One can reconstitute not only the demography of the community, but also the dynamics of kinship, marriage, social mobility and deviancy. Here the skills of the social anthropologist would be indispensable. Let me conclude. The rich material could enable anthropologists to study topics which so far they have been forced to avoid. Among such fields are the sociology of population change, the sexual ethics of a society not primarily based on kinship organisation and where incest does not appear to arouse great horror, and the kinship system of a complex society over time. The patterns of movement in an open society where there is a high degree of geographical mobility. The status hierarchy of a nation already highly differentiated and mobile. The economic organisation of a country that is gradually building up the resources for industrialisation without external models of aid. The religious beliefs of a people in a pre-medical age. The changing patterns of deviancy which go with all the above characteristics. In exchange, exploring these and other areas, it seems likely that many anthropological hypotheses will be refuted and many new ones elaborated. It will be necessary to learn a completely new language in order to communicate effectively with the community of study. But the language may often be a computer language rather than a contemporary spoken one. Algol or BCPL rather than Hindi. And behind the language is the structure of the data. This will also have to be assimilated. Such learning as in traditional anthropology, requires total immersion. A student may well spend up to two years studying a past group or community, but it will be done in his own room or at the computer console. For this reason, the task will be even greater for the historical anthropologist than for the conventional anthropologist. The imagination needed to reconstitute a society from the written clues available is even greater than that required when one goes out to a living society and analyses the permanence behind the surface ripples. Yet the task is similar in that the student has to go well beyond 
what the data actually tells him. As Levi-Strauss remarked of totemism, only what is forbidden is specified. This is true in general and hence we have to infer the positive, the normative, the invisible everyday assumptions. If this is the case in anthropology, it is also true in historical work. As Mark Bloch remarked, that which the text tells us expressly has ceased to be the primary object of our attention today. End of quote. Hence, as he puts it, we force documents to speak to us, I quote, against their will. End of quote. In both anthropology and history, we had to create a total virtual ideal model of the world that exists behind the fragments which we observe. This arrangement of the pieces into something larger than themselves is a creative, imaginative act and depends entirely on the sensitivity and assumptions of the observer. Computers are only a tool here and they make this kind of investigation possible. Like radio telescopes in astronomy, they make new discoveries feasible, though not inevitable. This creative effort on the part of historians, the fact that investigators do not merely describe but recreate the world they study is not always recognized even by the practitioners themselves. Many might accept the definition put forward by Samuel Johnson that, that the historian has facts ready to his hand so he has no exercise of, imagination, of invention. Imagination is not required in any high degree. This is obviously nonsense, but the recognition of its inaccuracy is not yet universal. Geoffrey Elton, for example, speaking of his work on Tudor government, claims that I may have misinterpreted the evidence, but I did not adjust it to my questions and preconceptions. In fact, the moment a historian selects a single piece of information and ignores others, he or she is bringing to the task a judgment based on a huge armory of preconceptions and assumptions of which he or she cannot possibly be aware. Collingwood realised the position and believed that the acceptance of this fact was the Copernican revolution in the theory of history. He defined this revolution as the discovery that so far from relying on an authority other than himself to whose statements his thought must conform, the historian is his own authority, possessed of a criterion to which his so-called authorities must conform. The anthropologist is, of course, notoriously in the same predicament. He or she must select and interpret, either using his own models or those of the people he studies. He or she's task is both easier and harder than that of the historian, for he is immediately offered numerous explanations for their behaviour by the actors. These he may be over-eager to accept. The historian has in the main to deduce 
motives and links in a vacuum. He is both freer to speculate and more likely to be entirely ethnocentric, a luxury of which historians have taken full advantage. If historical research can offer a whole new world of facts needing sympathetic interpretation, then anthropology can help stave off the ethnocentric biases which f often make such interpretation very difficult. Without anthropological models, much of our own past is literally invisible. We cannot even begin to see it because it is too close or too far. Without historical material, anthropological speculation is shadow thin. The historian's task is to turn this shadow into substance. He or she can only do this after an infusion of wider concepts and external models. A constant tension between original documentary research and universal hypotheses needs to be maintained. A subtle blend of functionalism and historical serial explanation is obviously more satisfactory than an undiluted dose of either. In the end, the aim of both disciplines is largely narcissistic. Collingwood remarked that we study history in order to attain self-knowledge, while Edmund Leach, the anthropologist, states that the social anthropologist looks at other cultures as in a mirror, the better to understand his own. We find in the end that the two giants of the fairy tale, the anthropological and the historical, are one and the same. His, or maybe it's a female giant's quarry, mankind, is unlikely to escape entirely.